Welcome to Deep Learning for NLP uh, Lecture 6. Uh, my name is Ivan Habernau and today we'll be talking about convolutional neural networks. Uh, in the last few lectures we spent a lot of time about talking, talking about embeddings and uh, different sorts of embeddings and why they are important. So the basic building blocks uh, what makes deep learning in NLP uh, so powerful this this representation of embeddings. And today we're moving a little bit to towards the end task. Where can we actually use the UN embeddings? And we'll be talking in particular about uh, classifying classifying sentences or documents. So it, we'll be talking about classification today. And one motivation, motivational example why classification is important and where it could be used is um, sentiment analysis or predicting the sentiment. So typically when we want to predict sentiment, we treat a task as a three categories prediction. So we typically treat it as positive, uh, negative, or neutral. It could be reviewed, could be a movie review or a product review typically, or a sentiment, uh, sentiment in other texts like uh, news wire papers. You might be wondering why this task, um, I mean, this task is very, uh, very popular and you might be wondering why. One reason for that is uh, just the abundance of data on the internet and I would say data are labeled for free because typically if you write a review somewhere on Amazon you give the stars as well and the stars can be treated as the actual label of the of the of the example and you want to just exploit a data set and and predicting uh, the gold standard labels which you give in for free and I guess this is one one reason why it it has become so popular the other is also uh it, there's some beauty about predicting sentiment, for example, in movie reviews. And uh, there was a, if you're interested in that, there was an invited talk by uh, Lillian Lee, uh, Lillian Lee at Knuckle uh, 2018, where she got a award for um, lifetime achievement uh, for basically for a paper, which she uh, co-authored some 15 years back, one of the first papers on predicting sentiment in movies. And she was explaining there that actually it was really fun to treat, you know, to, to, to treat the task of predicting sentiment in movies because of the beauty of the language. And it was super hard to model back then, all this uh, hyperbolic language and metaphors and so on. So there's also some reason why this is popular. But nowadays it's basically considered a standard, uh, standard task. So here's two examples of movie reviews from... Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, which is something like IMDb, so movie reviews, basically. And one of them, I quote, is uh, part of the charm of Satin Rouge is that it avoids the obvious with humor and lightness. And here's another movie review uh, from, a, I guess it's a James Bond movie. So I'll just quote this sentence. Still, this flick is fun and holds to some truly excellent sequences. And you might have noticed that some of some of the words in the sentences are very informative for the task, for the sentiment, such as the words charm, fun, excellent, while other words are not that much informative, like still, host, flick, lioness, and so on. And the key idea here, we have this signal uh, as, as words or engrams and they are informative regardless of way they, where they are in the sentence. So the position of them doesn't matter. And this will be one of the key modeling assumptions for using convolutional neural nets. So you might be thinking, well, we have we have the, the hammer already, and the hammer is uh, just a perceptron or deep, uh, deep network, multi-layer perceptron. So why not using that? And you could. But there are several problems that make it difficult to use multi-layer perceptrons for, uh, for example, for sentiment analysis, sentiment prediction. And one of them is that we have variable size input. So not all texts are the same, while standard MLP architecture expects the, the same input size because you have just um, a constant number of input neurons, for example. So you have to somehow take it into account and it's not that easy. The second one is we already had in a motivation example is the relevance of words. So some words are not very informative and some content words could be uh, like kidnapping here. I don't know, maybe it's a negative word in a review. They're, they're, in, they're important no matter where they are. 
And the third is something um, more technical related to multi-layer perceptrons. So if you if you think about how they work, you have all these neurons connected between uh, each two layers, and they're just densely connected together. And it might be like they have too many parameters in some situations, and you just cannot learn so many parameters given some availability of the data. So you might want to find some more clever solutions to that. So that's that's all for the motivation for convolutional neural networks. Uh, so we'll be talking today about the convolution and pooling, which is a special operation that they used in convolutional neural networks. And then we'll try to understand a little bit of the details, what makes them really working for NLP on these networks. So there will be some analysis later on. So we start with uh, some definitions and some formulas. What is the convolutional operation and um, how it looks like formally? There is, there is one thing we should keep in mind when we talk about convolutional neural networks is where it comes from. So convolution is, uh, is an operation which is known in signal processing. And it, it used to be, I mean, it's used, convolutional networks are used in computer vision quite a lot. So it makes the terminology a little bit different from uh, what we use in NLP. So we have a different names for, for the same things. Uh, it might be a little bit confusing. So there's, there's an abundance of different terminologies. So make always sure that you know what these letters mean in the, in the given context. So the convolution is, um, let's first talk about maybe about the variables. So we have some input at position Y. And uh, we represent the input as, as F, which might be confusing because typically F is some function. From the signal processing, it is a function in time. So we just take it um, as it is, but it's for us, it will be a vector, for example. The star, the clean star is a convolution operator. And this is the current position in some input. We have something which is a window size. Uh, that will be an example in the next slide, so we'll understand exactly what it means. But there is some window we're shifting over the input. And the G uh, is something which we call the filter or a kernel. So as you might see, filter definitely comes from signal processing. And G is typically a function letter as well. In our case, it will be well, it is a function, it will be a discrete function, it will be just a matrix of weights. So having this terminology a little bit understood, or at least having grasp on that, let's see what it means to do convolution on some input i indexed here. So we basically, it's a very simple, looks uh, somehow fuzzy. We basically take the position, we iterate over the window, so m, m is the window, and we iterate over the window, take uh, one point from the input and one point from the, from the kernel and just multiply them and sum them up. So I guess it's time for an example, which will be super clear. So here's an input representation. So this is F, uh, but it's just a vector. So we're in, in 1D, one dimension. Uh, and we have some filter or kernel G, which is another, uh, it's a smaller uh, matrix or vector in this case. And we're interested in what, uh, what comes out. If you're asking why these are ones and zeros, well, it doesn't matter. It's just arbitrary. It could be, you know, this could be uh, anything. And these are also like real numbers. So ones and zeros just for simplicity now. So let's have a look at the formula and try to calculate the first output. So in the first step, uh, we take our filter and basically uh, multiply it here in the first position. So each, each of these positions will be multiplied together and summed up. So we take one times one plus one times zero plus one times one which makes it two. Okay, so then we move the window, so we call this a uh, shifting window. We move the window one position to the right. And again, one times one plus zero times one plus one times zero, which gets us the one. So you get the gist now. It's basically shifting window and multiplying the input. So patching, so it's somehow like a patch. We patch it on each position and just multiply and sum up. This is 
discrete convolution, nothing more. So you can just compute for yourself how how the last position will be looking like. And of course, why stop in one dimension? Uh, if you work with images, for example, or in NLP, as we'll see later on, uh, we would have multi-dimensional input with uh, using embeddings. Then there is also uh, two-dimensional convolutional operation, and it's very similar to the to the one D. So basically, we are we have the window of uh, size m times n. So this will be our window or our kernel, and we're shifting this window over the input, and then in the input computing basically um, a product of each of these uh, entries in the input uh, vector or matrix and in the kernel matrix. So the only difference to 1D example as you had before is that we have a two dimension input or the output basically, and this is the indices in the input. And we have window size that is that doesn't have to be square. So it's just n times n. And we'll write, see right away in the example how it works. It's basically the same. So again, where these could be anything. So we just, you know, arbitrarily choose uh, uh, zeros and ones just for simplicity, but these are some real numbers uh, or arbitrary numbers. And what are we going to do? So again, we have this, um, this patch, this kernel, and we're gonna put it here into the input and move one point at a time and compute the outputs. So let's start. So we start at the first position zero zero, uh, and we just patch this matrix here and do this computation. So in the first row here, we got uh, one times one plus zero times one plus one times one, as we have here. And similarly for the second row, zero times zero, excuse me, uh, one times one and zero times one, as we have here. And the same for the third row, and we get the first number at zero, zero. Remember, so we're taking zero, zero, multiply the patch here and take zero, zero. So what is interesting here is that, you know, the the patch has to be you know, smaller than, than the input, obviously, and then the convolved output is smaller than the input. Why is that so? Well, because we'll see later on, we're just moving up until the end. So the last will be, Okay, now we go to the second one. So the same story goes on. We take the patch, we just move by one position here, and we do one times one, one times zero, plus zero times one, plus and so on, and we just uh, sum up all the products and get three. Now we move to, to the next position. So instead of here, we would move here, and this uh, convolution will get us this position. So of course it makes the dimension a little smaller because we cannot move it farther on. So we cannot really start here. Uh, well, in this case, I mean, we could, uh, we could just extend the input by adding zeros here. So we could say, okay, well, this is our true input and just add some maybe zeros here. So the patch can go up until the end. It's also possible. It's a design decision. But for now, we're just adding a full convolution, which is uh, we're stopping here at, um, at the edge. And it goes on and on. And the last, of course, will be, uh, will be here. So this will be our starting point. One times one, one times zero, plus zero times uh, one, and so on will give us the the last position. So you might see we're basically shrinking the input by the size of, by the window size. Basically here in this case, we have a, squ uh, a squared, uh, squ we have n times m, but in general it could be n times n. So it doesn't have to be, it could be like three times two or the size of the convolution. So I hope it makes it clear, these examples, there is definitely no magic in there. The, convolution, the discrete convolution is super simple. It's basically a product, a point-wise product, and, and summation. So convolution neural networks are um, are famous in uh, in computer vision, and there the dimension is pretty actually it's, it's larger. So it could be two dimensions or even three dimensions, 
because you have uh, not only the image, which is just the pixels, but we have uh, uh, three channels for colors. So there could be one which is, you know, another matrix which is uh, green, and I don't know which is a third one, red. I'm not sure if this is exactly like that, but you get it just so you get uh, three dimensions and plus batches, or you could you could have like alpha channels and so on. So multiple multiple channels in text, though. Um, typically, we have a you know. We have a one flow, one dimension. So these are tokens. And we though represent them as embedding. So we might be using 2D convolutions in NLP as well. But you know, it's uh, the dimensional is, is is slower and we have one direction of flow of text. So we will represent our input sent input sentence as um, stacked word embeddings of dimensional D. So if you have your text as, let's say, lorem ipsum, then your input will be the embedding of dimensional D times your, uh, your length. You know, so it could be uh, how many we have, well, like n tokens here. So this will be our input representation. So we stack the word embeddings. The word embeddings could be any size. So for example, the word to vec could be 300 dimensions or glove could be, I don't know, 300 as well or 256 or whatever. So any dimension. Then we have our convolutional filter or the kernel. And of course the kernel uh, has some size of, um, well, not of course, it's by design. It's working at some size h, which is the size of the filter, and it basically says how many neighboring words are we going to convolute together. We will have an example in the next slide, so it will be clear. But just to make sure the dimensions are really working on there, so we typically use the same dimension of the the second dimension of the of the filter as the dimensionality of the embeddings. Unlike in the example on 2D convolution, where we had just com completely smaller filter. And then also we have uh, this convolution operation as we had before. And in NLP, uh, we're adding some non-linearity to the output of this convolution. So typically it would be ReLU or it could be TAN or any other non-linear function. So let's have a look at a concrete example. Our input sentence uh, for sentiment analysis is pretty simple. It's just uh, four words. The movie was awesome. Um, it's a super simple example. I, I guess you can solve it with MLP or just some feature extraction, but it just serves the purpose. So we have these four words and what we're doing here is adding some, some special token, which we call pet or petting. Uh, why is that so? Well, it serves uh, multiple purposes. So the first one is that uh, we want to go the convolution just beyond the uh, beyond the first or the last token. So we want to make a convolution work as we see here uh, for you know, convolute um, on the edge, basically going beyond the edge. This is something we, we sh uh, I was sh um, showing before with the 2D uh, matrix. Another one is that we want to take care of uh, sentences or inputs of differing length. And this is the more important part. So, for example, because our network has a constant uh, input size, so this dimensionality has, be, has to be the same. So, if we have a uh, if we have a shorter uh, sentence, for example, our lorem ipsum, and we want to use the same input network, we would just you know. So, our input size is one, two, three, four, five, six. So, we would uh, simply add a first padding and then pet, pet, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we could feed the sentence into our, the same architecture and it will, it will work. It will work for some reasons, which I'll show later on because of the convolution. So this is one reason why, uh, you know, why we can work with, uh, input of different, different sizes or lengths. So, which is the key part of uh, NLP or texts. 
So we talk about this one, um, then we have these words represented as some embeddings and we take them pre-trained embeddings. So for example, it could be word to vec. Well, this is definitely not word to vec because we have only two dimensions. So we don't have, I'm not showing like 300 dimensions. We have only two uh, dimensions just for, uh, for demonstration purposes here. And then we have a convolution of window size three. And if you remember from the last slide, this size uh, tells us how many consecutive uh, inputs will be taken into the convolution. So uh, we can see it as a basically three gram convolution function. So we take three consecutive words here and compute the output. So let's take the three, uh, three first uh, embeddings and as we see they go to this one single output and the convolution will work i just made up these numbers but the convolution will output a single number as we had before and again we started here then we move to the to the next input and co compute here the black arrows show the second convolution output and then we move on and compute this here the third one and here we compute the last one, the last convolution. So there is no surprise. We were basically moving our sliding window and compute convolution over these embeddings. So now you might be wondering why is it so special? What makes it so different from, for example, uh, fully connected uh, deep networks and uh, multi-layer perceptrons? And there is a subtle difference here. So it's called sparse connectivity. And it means that not every input is connected to every output in the following layer because if you had here so i'm uh, if you had here a multi-layer perceptron there would be also for example this edge but we don't have it here we don't have this long uh, long range dependencies here we only have some local extraction so we're limited to some local context here and this is the difference between uh, the dense layers and the sparse connectivity. So they are sparse in terms of uh, limited local context. The second one is parameter sharing. What does it mean? Well, it means that all these operations, so there is some, you know, there is some uh, weight matrix involved in these operations. There will be the same for each of these operations. So the parameters will be same they are shared and they're also learned at the same time which is uh, which is helpful because you, you can learn a feature which occurs here or there so this is one of the assumptions we, we introduced at the beginning no matter where the feature occurs so awesome for example here or was awesome like a bigram and the weight matrix or the convolution matrix will learn that this is important somehow or give it some proper value later on for, for the network. And uh, then it doesn't matter if it appears here or somewhere else because the, the weights will be learned for this particular bigram, for example. So it's called parameter sharing. And it's also one of the advantages of convolutional neural networks because in the fully connected dense layer, these are different things, you know, because you have different weights here and different weights here and different weights here and so on. Here, everything is shared. So far, we, we have been moving the window just by one step size. So we were here and move to the next one and to the next one and to the next one and so on. Uh, this is parameterized by something called stride and this is basically the step size. Uh, for moving the window over the input or over the sentence. And stride of uh, size one is common in NLP or it could be others. Um, so in computer vision, you have different strides. Um, uh, so for example, here, this would be stride two, which means we, we, are, we start here, computer convolution, and then move by, not by one, but just by two in the input position and compute another convolution. And then we would move here, but then we don't compute anything because we just reached the end of the input, basically. So this is a parameter which might play a role. And uh, in NLP, we basically take everything which comes in, so stride of size one. 
So we were talking about the variable size input already. Uh, and as I said, the convolution layer can take variable size inputs, but in practice it takes a fixed input size because we we want to make the same uh, we want to use the same architecture of the input and don't change the architecture of the network by every input. So as I show, we pad with zeros so that all sequences are of the same length, which uh, gives some well some you have to make some assumptions to do so. For example, what will be my maximum sentence length? So is it going to be hundred characters or hundred words? Is it going to be two hundred words? Is it going to be 2000? It turns out that for most of the tasks that you're actually classifying, so for example, sentiment analysis, you can do some, uh, if you have some training data already, so you can make some uh, informed guess from the training data. So your length will be distributed somehow, maybe like that. And here you will say, okay, well, most of the reviews are no longer than, I don't know, like thousand, thousand words. Maybe it's way too much something like that and you just say well whatever is longer than thousand characters in reviews is some it's um it's an outlier and we're just gonna truncate it so we're just you know kill the, the remaining words from the from the review and we'll try to predict the review for uh, the sentiment of the review from just from the main body of the of the text which will work in most of the times so we are using these two tricks we treat uh variable size inputs as, as fixed and it works by using this padding. And why padding with zeros is plays a, is important, why, uh, why it plays a important role in, in uh, convolution networks is a mechanism called pooling. So it's another building block of CNNs, convolution networks, is that when we have um, several outputs so we have C1 and so on, the output values from the convolution filter, we just take one single value from that. And this will be, for example, max over time pooling is basically the maximum value. So if we have several inputs, we just take the maximum of them and this will be one, one output of that. And it's commonly used in NLP uh, there's other met methods for pooling, such as min pooling or mean pooling and so on, or some averaging. But basically max over time or max pooling is the most common uh, pooling in NLP and it works well empirically. And why is it important this pooling for uh, variable size input or basically for using the paddings? If you think about what the padding uh, if we pad with the zeros, what the padding is doing, so for example, we have this uh, input, so lorem, ipsum, and then pet and pet. So there will be some embeddings for each of these words. So one and two on one and four, and this will be zero, zero, and zero, zero. And if you run some convolution here, so I don't know, let's take two and let's take here will be maybe four and here will be maybe zero. If you take the maximum of that, of course it won't be from the padding. It will be somewhere from here. So the pooled version will be, if we take the maximum, will be the four. Then of course, no matter how many pets you had at the end, so if you like, you know, 100, pads, it will be all zeros from which you won't select anything. So it, the max pooling over time makes it possible to take whatever length of input you have and just select one important or the maximum feature which you found there. So here's a, here's a little bit nicer example of exactly what I was trying to show uh, in the previous slide. So we have the, the movie was awesome. So again, this is the same input we had before. We have our embeddings in two dimensions and we have again the same uh, same convolution filter with size three. So each three consecutive words are taken into one convolution and stride of size one. So we move just by one to the next convolution filter. So this is what we had we already had before. And now comes the max pooling. So we basically take this vector and find a maximum, which is going to be 0 0.9. And we just output 
just one value. So then comes the next maybe layers or we just want to classify uh, using softmax and so on. So this is just a one building block or the input building blocks of the network. And there could be many different things as we will just see in the next slides. Because so far we only showed one single filter or kernel, but typically we might have uh, many of them like hundreds or even thousands filters and they're could have different sizes so we only we've seen so far size 3 but you can have size 4 gram so this is h 4 gram or even up to 8 grams why not um, we'll see later one empirical um, examination of the length so how much that's important but in in theory you can have up to basically up to length of the input sentence typically you start with uh, by grams or even like unigrams. How does it look exactly in the architecture is as follows. So again, we have the input. It's the same. The movie was awesome. The embeddings. But here comes the difference. So we have now two filters, uh, each of them of size three. So we have filter one and filter two. And both have H3. So here, this one takes three inputs, one, two, three, and produces uh, this convolutional. But then the second filter again takes the first three inputs and produces the second one, so the blue one. And it moves on uh, to the next position, so stride one moves here again computes this first filter and second filter well basically you start with f filter one first compute all these uh, all these outputs and then, then take filter two and compute all these outputs actually in fact everything you know running these different filters can be super well parallelized and this is the big advantage of cnn is parallelization because these two filters they are independent of each other you know, which means they can run, they run on the same input. And then as soon as the input is given, you can run as many filters you have in parallel as your, as your GPU allows you to run in parallel. And basically they do because you, they can parallelize very well, these kind of co kinds of operations. And you get a super big speed up with convolutional networks because this convolutional operation, having different filters can be super well parallelized. It's just a matrix a matrix multiplication point wise, super fast. But back to our example here. So what we have here is now two filters of the same size. And again, we're gonna run max pooling and we do it for each filter in, in, in separation. So first filter will be here and the maximum value you know, comes from here. For the second filter, we take the second second vector, second column, and the maximum is coming from here, exactly. And we end up with uh, two values after max pooling. And with two values, you could theoretically do some softmax classification. It's a more, it's a better feature representation than just one value. But as I said, you you know you don't stop by two filters. You can just go for hundred filters. Now the question is what you know if these two filters have the have the same size mm, and they behave the same way how do you, you know what makes a difference here and the difference here is that you you initialize these two filters with different weights so initialize randomly mostly randomly so they have different weights which means they will learn different things most likely so they start somewhere uh, in the in the latent space and they will converge to some other values of these filters and they will learn different features so this is the advantage the more filters you have the the, the better chances of learning different feature extractors there is and here we continue with um more complicated example but it's just an extension of what we had so far so here we we have again two th uh, three gram filters so h is three 
and it's the same as before. So again, the same input sentence, sentence the, the same embeddings. And then we compute from the input using uh, you know, one, two, three, using the, um, the size of three, we're computing these two filters. And then we have two foreground filters. So foreground filters means they take uh, four consecutive words. So one, two, three, four, and compute a convolution over them. And then we, as we had before, we run the max pooling over, over these inputs. So basically here we run max pooling to get 0 0.8, then the same here to get uh, the maximum here, 0 0.5 and so on and so on. Um, here we get two vectors and you know, the softmax classifier uh, would rather work with uh, with a single uh, with a single vector. So what we typically could do here is basically concatenate these two into one single vector. So we would take this one and this one and concatenate and end up with uh, something like 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.3 and 0 0.6 and this would be a feature vector which we would feed into the softmax so typically that's what you're gonna do so max pooling is fine as we just saw but there's uh, because it's independent of the position so you take the maximum whenever it appears but one of the problems could be that if the same feature occurs once or multiple times so for example we have a um, uh, single word, a uh, unigram. So horrible, horrible, horrible. It would be extracted uh, by the same feature extractor. If it learns properly the sentiment, it will be extracted by the same feature extractor. And by the max pooling, you would have only you know, one information that this feature occurred there but you don't multiply it three times because that's not what max pooling is doing or how these feature extractors using convolution, how they work. So it could lead to some issues like, you know, it doesn't make it, if you were predicting the, the movie review uh, based on this sentence, uh, but not like a binary negative or positive or negative neutral positive, but on a, on a scale, well, this is pretty bad actually. So you would you would somehow need to take into account that everything was horrible. So it would be like on the scale uh, from minus one to one, for example, it would be here. While max pooling would tell you, well, you know, there is one feature which is horrible and you might not be really so much predictive and you would put it here. Now, these are assumptions, of course, in, in practice, it might not play a big role, but it it's important to keep that into account how the max pooling is working and what is ex exactly and actually extracting. Which brings me to the last part of this lecture. Uh, and it's a question, what actually do these convolution neural networks learn? Why are they so successful? So in computer revision, they are well understood. So CNN is convolution neural networks, not a, not a station. And they're well understood. And in computer revision, you can visualize that these uh, feature extractors actually do learn some low level first in the in the low, lower layers they learn some good feature representation for example of edges or some simple objects and if you stack them uh, we haven't talked about it but you can basically stack uh, convolutionals next to each other uh, if you stack them, they learn the deeper the network goes, they learn more about um, some abstract objects or maybe first objects and the abstract objects and you can visualize it and you somehow understand what the network is capturing. In text, uh, not much because one of the complexity in text is that even like the embeddings are some somehow uh, op opaque, uh, somehow obscure, 300 dimensions of words, you don't really exactly know why these are as they are. And if you visualize them, you can only visualize in two or three dimensions, which brings some uh, 
yeah, some simplification into that and it's hard to ex exactly explain. So um, there are these two authors in 2019 published a paper uh, called Sequential Learning of Convolutional Features for Effective Te Text Classification at uh, EMNLP. And they were asking these questions exactly, like what are convolutional networks learning, in fact? Uh, and the open question remained that, well, we have uh, the typical CNN architectures use convolution with fixed window size, and they move all the words in the sentence. And one of the question whether the sequential information, so for example, if you have like uh, very good or not that good and so on. So whether, for example, a negation, it's important that the negation is here. If the negation weren't here, you know, you, you change the meaning of that words. So whether the sequential information is preserved when we use convolutional across words. And they're actually asked, you know, whether there will be some effect if word sequences are randomly shuffled. So if you shuffle not that good into, for example, uh, good, that, not, which is which sounds like a Yoda, but it's, uh, it's really destroying our understanding of the task of sentiment analysis or negations. And if you shuffle them and apply the convolution, then what will happen? Will it work? And so on. So these are somehow um, uh, analysis tools for understanding uh, convolutional networks. So they did an, um, a series of experiments and they trained uh, convolutional neural networks with convolution applied on words. They used some GLOF word embeddings and they were uh, changing the window size from from one to maximum of the sentence length. So this is something I was showing in a, a couple of slides ago. So the age was from uh, from one to to n. So you know very very big variety of of the windows. And they this two version of randomly shuffling. So random ordering is basically scramble everything in the input sentence. Like everything is uh, it's just crazy. And the other was alternate shuffle, alternate shuffle swap every every two consecutive words. So, for example, a read book, forget movie, would be book read, movie forget. So they did some random sampling and were interested, like, will it work with convolutions and what will be the effects of that? And the results were super interesting because... Um, I'll just read the results and then explain the graph. So CN, uh, the networks fail to fully incorporate the sequential information because the performance on random ordering and correct ordering are marginally near each other, which is somehow uh, very uh, pessimistic. If you think about like language has meaning and we have to work with that as they, you know, for example, negations phenomena and so on. So if we look at this graph, uh, we have this three, uh, well, the green one is the correct ordering. So obviously it gets the best performance, right? Here, what we have is the window size. So this is the age. So the size of the convolution, how many consecutive uh, words are taken, taken into, into one convolution operation. And if you start here just with single word, yeah, sure. I mean, if you, you know, there is no difference, basically. It's just a, a, a random noise when repeating the algorithm uh, because of randomness on the, in the networks, because all of them take just single words. So there is no uh, influence of shuffling. And, but then if you shuffle, uh, you know, if you take uh, the original input and go to size, for example, seven, which is here, you get the same performance as with just you know no ordering or random ordering or whatever you you know you just scramble the input of of that you know roughly and so the longer the context in the original the worse it performs and it just performs on par with something where you just shuffled uh, small windows so this is somehow interesting well, it's a, it's a negative result in sense of like the, the length doesn't really matter because if you take the actual, you know, length of everything, all of them are equally good or bad. 
you know there is no information that you can take from the from from the sequential information when compared to something which you completely scramble and just you know let the words fl float around in the sentence so when we increase the window size it's really worse but they also compared this to some uh, context blind algorithms so like deck of words where you just uh, take all the words completely ignore uh, the sequences of words and and run mlp on that and they show like cns are better than this quite a lot so they are still learning something valuable so the question is what actually are these convolutional networks learning when they not uh learning the the ordering or the sequential information if it doesn't play any role what plays a role so they took their window for size one on the sentiment analysis task so just a single single word so convolution acts over a single word there is no sequential information whatsoever nothing and the words will always have the same perspective convolution output because it is a feature extractor, so the same words will have the same output. So it turned out that the convolution layer here is basically, if you you know, if you remember the um, the input, so lorem ipsum, here we have the the embedding vector. Here the embedding vector, and if we have just a size one h1 convolution so we don't take two inputs as with size two we just take one and extract something from which we you know we have uh, maybe just one filter and there will be second filter and then some you know, max pooling and so on so the typical thing but basically all these are independent of the others so they learn something from, from just a single word. So we can imagine this is basically taking the embeddings here and project it to, projecting to another, another space. You know? So it's a transformation of embeddings. So they explored um, the embeddings, uh, the glove embeddings, uh, before training and after training. So here we have a blue are positive words with positive sentiment red with negative and green that are semantically close to negative sentiment words and this is the original embeddings um, we're using uh, tsne projection to tie two dimensions so it's a uh, it's similar to um, pca projection but it's somehow uh, more uh, it's working better with uh, for example uh, word embeddings so you should check it out. It's a it's a cool projection. So they were using this TSNE for projecting word embeddings um, before and after, and they found out that a convolution la layer somehow tunes input embeddings. So they're then closer to the positive sentiment cluster than to their original semantic cluster, and we can show it on examples uh, on the next slide. So for example. The word killer in the original space was more closer to the to the negative cluster so killer horror thriller mystery close to bad awful and so on so it's glove embeddings but in the sentiment data set or this movie sentiment killer is often used to describe a movie very positively so it's a killer movie and you can see it here so after learning uh, the, the transformation through convolution then we see that a killer is uh, not closer to these negative sentiment words but is closer to to the positive sentiment words also there is this interesting word pretty so in the original pretty was somewhere very positive here but then it's uh it's midway through it's somewhere between the cluster uh, the negative and the positive and why is that so because well you, you described the movie it's pretty bad or pretty good so it's it's becoming a negative so these convolutions uh, are actually learning better feature extractions from word embeddings and this is also the take-home picture uh, take-home message from this paper which i highly recommend to read uh, they have other other details on for example the max pooling whether max is always better than than the average and so on but the main take-home message is that uh, 
the sequential uh, information is not really helping, but the, the task appropriate features are important and this can be learned through this convolution. Uh, so this brings me to the end of this lecture. I guess it was a little bit shorter one, but um, I hope very interesting, at least the analysis. I really enjoyed actually reading these papers. And to, to sum up what we learned that convolutional neural networks can deal with variable size inputs. So as opposed to multi-layer perceptron and they work through sparse connectivity and parameter sharing. So feature extractors, uh, we have some narrow and wide convolutions. The pooling is used for extracting the most relevant features. And we're using the typically max overtime pooling. And the tasks where convolutional neural networks are used is typically for, actually it's true, uh, for sentence classification. If you look into the ACL anthology, you see most of them are used for sentence classification because you can extract the features or engram features uh, pretty well with that, or aspect-based sentiment analysis, for example, is very, very popular. Convolutional networks are still important as part of, um, of graph convolutional networks. So this is uh, another topic, graph convolutional networks where the input is um, is in form of the graph. So it could be something from a social network or um, maybe uh, citation networks and so on. And their convolution is also an important building, building block of that. And graph convolution networks are super important for different types of tasks. So not classification of documents, but classification of documents in a, in a connected setup. So having said that, um, thanks a lot for watching this movie. Oh, it's not a movie, no, movie reviews, but a, a lecture about movie reviews and how to classify them. And uh, I would highly recommend to read these two papers. So one is uh, the, the most cited paper on convolutional neural networks, I guess is one which uh, started it all from MLP 2014. Uh, with uh, some nice graphics and explanations in there. So I highly recommend to have a look at this. And also on the, the analysis paper we are just um, talking about, it's also very nice read. So have a look at that and thanks. Um, hope to see you next time.